All right, so sometimes I think it's hard for people to put together this idea that I have neurological symptoms. My eyes are blurry, I'm feeling dizzy, I got headaches, I got brain fog, problems controlling my heart, pick your thing, right? But sometimes we have a hard time taking that and then superimposing it on top of like, how do problems with my neck actually interface with this? It does, like it doesn't connect for a lot of people and that's reasonable. So I wanna just take some time and go through two studies today that walk us through why I think about the importance of signals from the neck. So like the actual proprioceptive joint mechanical signals that are transmitted to the brain to be able to tell you where your head is in space. And then how does that interface with the vestibular system, with the visual system? And can we use that as a mechanism for helping people recover from these types of symptoms? And I think that that is a really important outcome that we need to understand very well. So we're going to spend some time on it today. Hope you like it. So the first one is from 2018. In this particular paper, what they looked at was they just took normal people, 20 to 35 year olds, half males, half females. And they said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to look at static neck flexion. What does that mean? So we're going to look at static neck flexion, just tucking your chin down to your chest and holding it there. And they did it for 10 minutes. And they did a couple measurements of neck proprioception and what they call anticipatory postural adjustments. So this is like your ability to predict. If we think about it really basically, if I don't get signals from my neck, from the mechanoreceptors up to my brain, my response times to be able to make predictive activities, right? Like to anticipate something are going to be depressed. And that's what they're looking at in this study. So we just took normal people and uh, they did it before and after. They checked out those two things. So they did 10 trials of this this test where you basically put a laser on your head and then try to point your head in the right spot. And then they do the same thing afterwards. So what's really interesting is following the flexion, the absolute and variable errors in the repositioning increased. And then there was also a delay in the onset of myoelectric activity. So that's electricity in the muscles of the cervical spine muscles after they did that 10 minute flexion. So what does that mean? If we kind of break it down, we say it real simply, it means that sustained 10 minute neck flexion, which I think a lot of people do through the course of the day, because usually they just, you know, there's a phone parked right here and we do that. So it's like 10 minutes on TikTok, 10 minutes on Instagram. And after that, we see immediately there's this change in the neurological outputs. So it's not just like the muscles get sore, or you get a little stiff, it's actually like the electrical activity to your brain slows down. And because of that, your brain cannot make the normal anticipatory adjustments that it would typically make just as a normal part of posture that you don't think about. So this is a problem. And this makes us more susceptible to both neck injury, but also when we start to get into the chronicity of neck pain. So that's just in normal people. And we can then kind of think about, huh, if I've also got a brain injury thing going on, or I've got something that's affecting outputs from my brain, I wonder how those two things are overlapping. I could probably say at a minimum that it's not helping if there's something wrong with my neck. Okay, so we'll look at a second piece of this, a second study here. This one's from 2023, so this is a little newer. And this one's going to take a look at just forward head posture. So like, how do people sit and stand? Do they stand upright with their ear over their shoulder, or is that head kind of coming forward? I don't think it's a secret to anyone that we're trending toward having that forward head posture become a, a pretty common signal, both in adults, but also in our youth, which is becoming very interesting. So what they looked at, they actually did a nice study. They looked at this angle between looking at your kind of this T1 area, so the cervical thoracic junction. I don't know if you can see that right here. And then they're looking at the angle between that and the external acoustic meatus of the ear. And so you just draw a horizontal line, and then you can see that there's an angle there. And this person is sitting up a little straighter. And then you see here with this person over here on the right, box B, not so much. So we have this, this point where the T1 is back here and the, the external acoustic meatus is kind of way out front. And because of that, it changes the angle. So what they looked at in this study was they wanted to see a little bit deeper. So going beyond just kind of the head positioning, they were like, you know what? Let's actually use an SCP, which is a somatosensory evoked potential where you can see how fast the electrical signals are going from the neck or from wherever you're measuring from when they hit the spinal cord, when they hit the brainstem, and when they hit the parietal cortex. So that's kind of the pathway that all these checkpoints are going through. As that signal goes up to your brain, it's dropping off collaterals like a train station. And what this is basically measuring is like, how on time are these electrical signals once they hit spinal cord, once they hit the brain stem, once they hit the parietal lobe in the brain, the sensory cortex. And what they found was really interesting. So again, you can see 
Here's where they're talking about the measurement. We're just in the in the, the abstract here. They're measuring the peak-to-peak -peak amplitudes, and these are the points. And we even have a frontal point in there. Oh, excuse me, we got a spinal brainstem and then parietal and then frontal points. And they're measuring the conduction time. And then they applied a generalized linear model to that. And what they found was pretty interesting. So what they what they noticed here was that as forward head posture increased, sensory motor integration and somatosensory evoked potential processing becomes less efficient. So we can actually see the the electricity, the signal as we measure it slows down. The amplitude becomes less. So what they notice here is that increasing working hours, so time spent at a computer for these folks, adversely affected the SEP measurements. And it was basically like, so every degree that it goes more toward neutral, toward being upright, we see an increase in sensory motor efficiency. So for every one degree you get back, you're getting back efficiency on that. So I think that that's pretty cool. So what, what we can kind of take away from this is this idea that if we look even at normal people, positioning matters. The, the amount of time that we spend with our head in a, a suboptimal position has an impact on the information that we get to our brain. If we then look at people that have it to the point where they're chronic and they start to hold that position over time, then we see that it has even more of a de deleterious effect. So we're changing the way that we're sending signals to our brain, which is not ideal. If we overlap that with people that may have an injury to their brain, and we think about, well, what if somebody's also like got in a car accident and they also injured their neck, they had a sprain? What if they were a football player and they also had a you know a rotational injury to their neck or or what if they were a person that had a neck injury years ago and then they get sick and you realize like, well, even though it was years ago, there's a likelihood that we're seeing a decrease in affrontation over this long period of time. And then something else happens and that's just enough to start to send you into a symptomatic presentation where you might not have experienced that before. So I think these are very important points to cover as we look at people that have both significant symptoms from activity in their brain, from, from having an injury or being sick or, or whatever that looks like. But then I also think it's very important for uh, those of us who maybe don't have symptoms, but maybe can look for ways that like we'd want to prevent them in the future. And if we're starting to notice that creep of changing in our posture, it's an indicator that we are likely changing activity to the brain. So it's a lot to think about. I hope it provokes some questions and uh, further conversation. So hope it helps. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.